It's okay? It's okay. So All right. now Matthew will tell us about uh, the resumption of the time, uh, please. Okay, thank you Alfredo, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to share the stage today with uh, Leonardo. We've, we've been aware of each other's mutual interest in this uh, interesting, uh, interesting field theory puzzle uh, for probably longer than we'd care to admit. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about my paper that came out at the end of last year uh, with Raman Sundram, which again falls under the same uh, basic, uh, basic rubric as Leonardo. We're trying to understand this uh, st Starobinsky uh, stochastic inflation resolution of these infrared divergences in De Sitter. Um, like him, uh, we wanted to demonstrate it as a systematic expansion, uh, and we have a slightly different, uh, slightly different approach, which I'll now elaborate on. I just want to mention briefly for anyone who knows anything about me, I spend most of my time as a particle phenomenologist, um, making predictions for indirect detection dark matter experiments and the LHC. And so, you know. One natural question I have is why did I get interested in such a formal, uh, formal field theory topic? This was my first sort of primary hep TH paper. And the answer why a phenomenologist cares about these uh, formal conceptual issues is that the universe has a strange predilection for the center space. Um, of course, the uh, cultic inflation is our leading candidate for the early universe, which means in our deep past, our universe was approximately described uh, by a de Sitter like space time. And then with the discovery of dark energy, you know that our future uh, is also going to be given by an increasingly uh, De Sitter-like cosmology. And it's possible that uh, the value of the cosmological constant that sets that acceleration uh, arose through a mechanism like eternal inflation, which again uh, would arise from De Sitter-like dynamics. I have one piece of actual data, it's the only data in the entire talk, which is that the famous uh, two-point uh, temperature anisotropy function measured by experiments like Planck. Uh, it goes like nearly one over k cubed. And of course, the, the, it's predicted from slow roll inflation that it will be deviated slightly from a perfect one over k cubed uh, dependence. Um, but if one is in a strict pure to sitter uh, geometry, then it's, it's literally one over k cubed. And we'll get into why that uh, leads to both problems and then very interesting non-trivial physics. Um, for the most part, I, I think this problem is, is useful to attack as a warm up for getting at other uh, deeper conceptual questions. And Leonardo, of course, hit, hit heavily on its role uh, that it plays in understanding eternal inflation. So I'll just um, emphasize that myself. It's, we, we, we're now almost an entire generation uh, past the discovery of dark energy. Um, we would still like to understand how a rigorous solution to the cosmological constant problem and eternal inflation in the landscape are a very promising solution, but we would like to be able to do rigorous uh, calculations to solve the measure problem. Some of the best, uh, some of the best papers in this front were the ones Leonardo mentioned uh, from the late 2000s. Um, but this is still this is still uh, not a completely solved problem. Um, but it's just worth mentioning. Jumping to my punchline, uh, what we can get is uh, a systematic calculation of a probability distribution. Uh, over field strength values at very late times, exactly the sort of thing one would hope to have in attacking the measure problem. Um, like Leonardo, we're working in a fixed De Sitter geometry, but all one needs to do is relax, uh, relax that assumption, allow, allow back reaction, which, which as, as he stressed, uh, can be done uh, perturbatively, and one is now doing, uh, now one is now doing rigorous calculations, whether you take uh, his approach or, or ours. So uh, let's, let's jump into the problem, just, just to state it uh, here for those who missed Leonardo's talk. Um, <clears throat> if you compute the two-point function of a massless, free, minimally coupled scalar on a De Sitter background, uh, this blue equation is that two-point function, and you see the, uh, the leading term uh, at late times, or, or in small k, uh, is, this, is this one over k cubed, exactly what uh, Planck is measuring uh, approximately so. Uh, in the sky, but here it's 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 one over k cubed. And just to set some notation, uh, I'm taking uh, in this orange bubble. I'm taking the uh, flat FRW like slices of De Sitter, and I'll be going back and forth between uh, time and conformal time. Conformal time uh, eta goes to zero in the arbitrary future. So one over k cubed is an innocent 
enough function, but all I have to do is Fourier transform my two-point function to get something in position space, and I'm uh, hit over the head up front with the fact that it's IR divergent. It's a DK over K divergence, which I just have to regulate if I want to, if I want to have a non-pathological answer, and then I have to deal with the consequences of that regulation, understanding how it can be removed. Um, we're taking, uh, we're taking any UV divergence to be uh, equivalent to what one would get in flat space. Um, in the deep UV, the sitter should just go over to the physics of Minkowski space. Uh, so any UV divergence we're going to take to be handled by standard local counterterm renormalization. But that's not how one resolves infrared divergences. Um, and so for now, we just cut that off and deal with the consequences. So here is my Fourier transformed uh, two-point function in position space. And sure enough, it has, this, uh, it has this logarithmic dependence on this cutoff I put in. You can, of course, think, try to think physically what such a cutoff could be. Maybe our universe wasn't to sit into the arbitrary past. It was some earlier cosmology that was manifestly IR safe. And so this, what this cutoff really is is a proxy for sort of the time that, that transition occurred, and that gives, you, that gives you some physics intuition why it should be a, a co-moving cutoff. Um, and of course, one could, one could compute in that theory. Maybe it's, it's a healthy theory, but now you're, you have to worry about your sensitivity uh, to the details of when inflation started, and that runs a little bit afoul uh, of this intuition we have that uh, inflation is a great eraser. Of what of what happened in the past, and yet we seem to be uh, divergently sensitive to those to those past details. Um, but as we'll see, in fact, one can take in, in the end one will be able to take this cutoff uh, to zero. Um, but the first thing we need to do is diagnose diagnose the problem. How bad is this sensitivity? Because if this if this cutoff dependence or sensitivity the initial time is present in our propagator, then no matter how tiny we make uh, our coupling and say a phi to the four theory, uh, dependence on this cutoff or initial time uh, is going to proliferate into diagrams. So our first, our first task then is just to diagnose this sensitivity and then, and then we can think about how we might be able to, to regain control. And as I, as I alluded to earlier, we're ultimately going to arrive at the same resolution uh, as Starobinsky, uh, but through a systematic uh, calculation using Feynman diagrams. So to diagnose the problem, we need, of course, to have in mind a particular calculation. And we're going to be taking, uh, going to be taking the standard you know, in-in computation of a phi to the n expectation value. Um, again, thinking about massless uh, polynomially coupled fields, phi to the 4 being the, the natural candidate. So in this purple equation, I have just sort of the standard uncontroversial uh, in-in in the interaction picture expression. I'm taking Bunch Davies to be my uh, non-interacting uh, ground state and the, the prime is just is just there to, to represent the presence of our infrared cutoff. Now there's a very useful reorganization of in-in perturbation theory that, that goes back to Weinberg's famous O5 cosmology paper, um, which reorganizes uh, this in an expectation value as a set of nested Commutators, so it's it's still an interaction picture uh, still an interaction picture computation, um, but you what you instead do is operationally you're taking commutators of uh, the operator you're taking the expectation value of in our case phi to the n uh, with the interacting Hamiltonian, and you go out to whatever order and perturbation theory you you want to work with. Uh, and we found this to be a very useful reorganization. In particular, it enforces manifest causality. You can just see from the structure of this equation in one shot that, say, any, any interaction vertex, which is going to influence your, uh, your correlation function observable, has to have occurred in the past light cone um, of your correlation point, which is to say, if you're, if you're doing an experiment at that point, um, the physics that influences that experiment is causal. Now, it's... It's worth pointing out in a brief technical aside uh, that there's, this is not a completely uncontroversial reorganization. Um, when we compute in the interaction picture, of course, we have in mind um, the ground state of the theory, which is to say the true interacting uh, ground state, which in this red equation is, is meant 
to be symbolized by this uh, omega state. And you know, as we're quite used to from standard interaction picture and even S matrix calculations one does for particle physics, right? The standard procedure is you do an I epsilon deformation on your contour, and that has the effect of projecting out uh, everything in the true vacuum except for the free vacuum. And so that's what allows us to, to do perturbative calculations where we, we, we get to compute, we get to do Wick's theorem on the free vacuum. Everything boils down to simple manipulations of A's and A daggers, and then we can, we can compute away. The problem uh, with what I want to do is that you, you see in this equation that the, the uh, I epsilon deformation on the ket evolution and the broad evolution is, um, is different. Um, we've broken unitarity, and even more important for the point of view of, of our approach is, is we've broken the manifest symmetry between ket evolution and broad evolution. Um, it was that symmetry that allowed us to repackage things in the form of commutators. Um, fortunately, uh, this, this epsilon is playing, of course, it, it's playing a crucial role, but it's also playing a very simple role. It's just there to sort of, when you go to take the limit that you're evolving from the far past and doing this projection, it's basically just there to kill off, uh, to kill off the integrals at minus infinity. It basically, you know, when you track it through in the end, it basically gives you permission to not take the integral solution at, at minus infinity. You get to drop it because it's been suppressed by this epsilon. And so because it's playing such a simple role, in fact, the, the precise details of how it enters are not particularly important. And in fact, there's an equivalent epsilon deformation um, that is manifestly unitary. You basically just deform your phi field uh, with an e to the epsilon t. And even though uh, that leads to different, uh, different expressions uh, from this red equation, the uncontroversial equation, uh, in the end, when one goes to take uh, evolution from the far past, uh, you're dropping exactly the same terms. This, this was uh, conjectured in a very nice paper by Ali Kaya from a couple years ago, and uh, this summer, Raman and I hope to have a, a technical refinement uh, of it coming out. So we, we, hope to, we hope to have that out uh, in the near future. But getting back uh, to, uh, to massless scalars and to sitter, uh, if one hasn't paid attention to the talk up to now and is planning to zone out in the future, I just want to stress the next three slides are the most crucial for the entire talk. So uh, with this Weinberg nested commutator reorganization um, of perturbation theory, it lends itself to a particular uh, set of diagrams. When, when doing in-end calculations, of course, unlike S matrix calculations, uh, we don't just get to deal with Feynman propagators, we, we typically have to deal with, with a larger basis. And the reorganization that pops out of this nested commutator reorganization uh, gives you propagators that are either anti-commutator, this G plus, uh, and commutator. And, and because of the time ordering of the interaction picture, they're actually retarded propagators because each one comes with an explicit theta function. And then we just ask, um, you know, the, the, the non-trivial physics I'm trying to diagnose and understand is in the infrared. So let me just expand these propagators in the infrared and see where their support is for soft momenta. And I'll find that the G plus propagator, that's the source of the one over KQ. This retarded propagator actually scales like K to the zero is in the limit that K goes to zero. And so very naively, you would say, oh, if I want to understand the leading IR physics in this problem, I should just take G plus propagators everywhere because clearly they have the most infrared support. Um, but, of, but the advantage of this nested commutator formulism is that it's telling you that um, no, because of causality, causality is enforced by these retarded propagators. Those are what strictly vanish outside of the past. Of the plane. And the nested commutator structure tells you that you have to include a certain number of these retarded propagators. And in fact, there are some, there are some constraints and rules that come along with, with this. In particular, you need to have at least one commutator per vertex, which is to say every vertex has to know that it's in the past light cone of your correlation point. And of course, you need to have a non-trivial commutator with the correlation point itself to set up the whole chain. And so for any legal non-vanishing diagram, I have this decomposition in G plus and G retarded propagators. And uh, the diagrammatics we've chosen 
uh, are just on rotation is that solid lines are retarded and the dashed lines are the anti-commutator. And so I've, so these two diagrams in the right column are two legal non-vanishing diagrams. As you can see, they both have retarded propagators touching uh, each of the two vertices and at least one retarded propagator is touching, uh, touching the external correlation point. Um, this means that any graph, if a graph has P propagators and V vertices, uh, then there will be V retarded propagators in the leading log limit and P minus V anti-commutator propagators, which is to say that just at the integrand level, you already see that you're dealing with uh, a log of your infrared cutoff phrase to the P minus V power. But that's the integrand. We, of course, want to understand the full correlation function. Um, but just to, just to maybe labor on this point a little bit because it's, it's, it's uh, crucial for the whole setup, um, this diagrammatics of Weinberg's nested commutator in informalism was worked out in a very nice paper uh, by Mousseau in 2006. You decompose your inner perturbation theory into uh, retarded propagators, anti-commutator propagators, and Whiteman propagators. Whiteman propagators are just the dumbest two-point function with no additional structure. I can, of course, realize my Whiteman propagator as a linear combination of retarded and anti-commutator. Uh, and since the soft physics is dominated by the anti-commutator propagator, the Whiteman propagators are also scaling like one of the K cubed. For the purposes of our work, um, Whiteman and anti-commutator are interchangeable since they have the same uh, power counting. You could, of course, go in and write every Whiteman propagator as this linear combination and, and, and work it all out. Um, but what I've shown in this white box is for any graph, uh, here this solid black line labeled eta in the top right corner is just my correlation time. This is a two-point function to follow the fourth theory, it's second order of perturbation theory. So the top is sort of a topological skeleton uh, where all, every propagator is just Whiteman. These other two diagrams um, I'm decomposing now into retarded and anti-commutator. And so both the leading log and excluding log are, are, are legal non-vanishing diagrams. But in this, in this leading log diagram, I've only put in the retarded propagators I've needed to enforce causality. Um, in the next leading log diagram, I, I've added an additional retarded propagator that will give a non-vanishing result. Um, but because I've put in a k to the zero where I could have put in a one over k cubed, uh, that is a subleading contribution. And so putting all these rules together, we find, the very, uh, we find this very interesting property. My leading log budget is v-retarded propagators. I have to spend v-retarded propagators, otherwise I get, I have to spend at least v, otherwise the, the graph is just zero, um, because somewhere uh, in this chain of nested commutators, I will wind up taking a commutator of c number quantities, which will just vanish. So I have to spend v. I can spend more than V, but as I just argued, if I do, I get, uh, I get a subleading uh, infrared dependence. And so with these constraints, I have to spend V and exactly V retarded propagators. If I just look at an arbitrary graph and then look at the subgraphs given by the retarded propagators, they are always trees. They are always trees that touch one and only one external correlation point. So if in, the, in these two graphs on the right-hand side, um, the top graph is just a single tree. Um, the bottom graph, we see that there are two different tree diagrams, but they both satisfy these rules, only touching one uh, and only one external correlation point. And so here we see, just at the level of Feynman diagrams, this, uh, this lower statement we hear all the time that the de Sitter, uh, that, that the super horizon sector of de Sitter is semi classical. So, uh, Given that, we just, we just want to finish diagnosing the, our sensitivity to the infrared cutoff. Um, the nice thing about uh, the retarded propagators coming in the form of trees is that I can assign every loop momenta to a G plus propagator. And so the leading log into fully integrated calculation ones are being quite simple. For all of my G plus propagators, I get a D3K over K cubed integral. That just gives me a log. Uh, for my retarded propagators, uh, if, I, if I go to the soft limit, and also, uh, also take the fact that uh, the times being strongly ordered and hierarchical uh, is the leading contribution, which is to say I can just keep um, the earliest or largest and absolute value time. I get a series of 
uh, d eta over eta integrals uh, with the one with the eta cube coming from the target propagator and the one over eta to the fourth coming from the measure, which is to say all of my integrals just give me log of kir <laughs> since there are p minus v g plus propagators and v g retarded propagators and limiting log limit. That's a total of p factors of log kir, where p is the number of propagators in the diagram. And so this effect, it's independent of diagram topology. It's just counting the number of propagators. So uh, these three graphs on this, uh, in the middle of the slide, uh, each have five propagators. And so they all scale like uh, t to the fifth when I replace uh, conformal time with coordinate time. Of course, I've just been tracking log kir, but by, uh, by dimensional analysis, the only scale I have left to balance that log kir in my correlation function is the correlation time itself of eta. So that is, so that's the problem we have to, uh, we have to cure. So let's, let's get into the cure, which again is ultimately going to be that of Starobinsky and take what maybe at first glance, it seems like an aside, uh, but let's just remind ourselves how perturbation theory works in classical field theory. Um, and I've taken a very uh, suggestive uh, depiction of a classical perturbation theory diagram. The diagrammatics of classical perturbation theory maybe isn't quite as, as famous as Feynman diagrams for quantum field theory, um, but it's, it's, it's quite straightforward. If I want to perturbatively solve uh, a classical field theory, um, and in this, in this diagram I'm showing the fourth order solution for some field, um, I solve whatever I call my free theory, that gives me some set of phi naughts, and then I, I, I take my retarded propagator, which is just the Green's function for the differential operator that defines my theory, and I can crank out perturbative solutions by convolving these retarded propagators with each other and ultimately uh, my free field solution. Okay, so in this graph, all of the solid lines are these retarded propagators, and then uh, everywhere I just wind up inserting a free field, that's a dashed line, which I've and then I terminate that uh, in an X. <laughs> what is the, in the center, what is the equation that I'm solving perturbatively? After all, I have these retarded tree uh, diagrams all over my quantum field theory diagrams. Um, and this black equation, the top line is the full, uh, the full equation of motion for my field. <laughs> and uh, as, as, as Leonardo stressed and, and and we agree with uh, this equation is approximately that of a first order gradientless theory. So I take, I take that approximation of the equation of motion. And then I can just look at what is the, uh, what is the Green's function uh, that's in my Feynman diagrams. In the soft limit, it's just this blue equation. But that winds up being equivalent to the Green's function of that top line equation if I zero out the potential, which is to say that's going to be my. Uh, my free theory is the non-interacting phi dot equals zero uh, theory, but in, in the sitter space. Um, <laughs> and so what these retarded trees are doing in each of my quantum field theory diagrams is, is solving that phi dot, uh, phi dot equals V prime equation, but it's important, right? Ultimately, we're not doing classical field theory. We're, we're, we're doing a full quantum field theory, theoretic calculation. And so, um, Right, if I were doing classical field theory, I would ultimately owe you a phi naught. I would need to give you some particular initial uh, condition that would pick a particular free solution, then I could give you an actual perturbed solution as an equation. Here I don't have a phi naught uh, as a classical solution. Um, but what I do have is, is some quantum noise that's going to modify my differential equation from being the simple phi dot equals V prime first order classical equation to being an, an inhomogeneity. It's, it's going to be, an, from the point of view of the classical theory, it's some source of random noise. Okay. And, and we get a, we get a non-trivial finite dot because in the, in the true quantum field theory, our quantum fluctuations have a time dependence. <laughs> so this is how I want to reorganize my fully quantum field theoretic diagrams. So uh, this diagram in the lower left corner those are the same legal uh, Feynman diagrams I drew before, but now I've cut open my anti-commutator propagators uh, and capped them with these X's. But we see these are now identical to my classical field theory perturbative diagrams. So 
what I'm saying we do when we compute any of these correlation functions is first do all of your uh, wick contractions that involve the retarded propagators. That will then give you uh, a series of classical perturbative diagrams. Now I go through and I do run my remaining wick contractions, which by construction are those that involve uh, the anti-commutator. And what those have the effect of doing is sewing up all of my dangling fine off ends that I would have plugged in for in a classical field theory. Now I just sew them up and instead I replace them with, uh, I replace them pairwise with the uh, quantum G plus two point function. So let me take an arbitrary correlation function phi to the end. Let me just take its time derivative. And this phi dot is just going to, I'm just going to replace it by my equation of motion. It's phi dot equals V prime plus phi naught dot. So uh, the, the V prime term, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, that will ultimately become the, the drift term in our fokker Planck equation. Uh, I can think for a moment about this, this quantum noise term, this rightmost term in the blue equation, phi naught dot. Um, if, I, if I think about what it means to take a correlation function with a phi naught dot, um, I find that, that my, uh, my leading Green's function, my leading soft Green's function involving that phi naught dot uh, vanishes unless I've contracted it with another phi naught, which is itself at the correlation time, which has the effect of replacing two phi naughts in the expectation value uh, with an h cubed. And so I get back, uh, I get back this very nice uh, compact equation uh, that shows the evolution of any uh, endpoint correlation function, um, where again, the V prime term is coming from my, uh, my classical interacting field theory and the, the expectation value of phi to the n minus two is accounting for this, uh, the time dependence of my quantum noise. Um, this equation was originally uh, derived by Woodard following on Starobinsky's intuition in the mid 2000s. And uh, he actually gave a solution for it for a phi to the fourth field theory. And, and we find, sure enough, that our, our power counting that we suppose checks out, that, that we do in fact find that, that um, we, get, we get a scaling in time that goes like uh, t, to the number of, t to the number of propagators. Okay. But since I have this update equation for an arbitrary endpoint function, uh, I can make an ansatz then for uh, the time evolution of a generating function, what I'll call p, where again, if I integrate phi to the n against p, that is just meant to give me my, uh, my expectation value for phi to the n. And sure enough, uh, I need the p to evolve in time according to this Fokker Planck equation if I want to recover my update equation uh, for the endpoint correlation functions. <coughs> And um, as Leonardo showed, we can, we can solve this soccer Planck equation. And at late times, uh, all of these gamma n's are strictly positive. So at late times, p just goes over to being an e to the minus, uh, e to the minus v distribution. And so we can compute things like endpoint functions at arbitrarily late times. And, and sure enough, we find that despite the breakdown in perturbation theory, the energy density uh, in our scalar field at arbitrarily late times just scales like a Hubble to the fourth which is exactly what you would have guessed uh, had you never thought about this problem and someone asked you at uh, three in the morning uh, what the energy density of a, of a scalar fee, massless scalar in the sitter would be like. Now, we should stress that all I've done is, uh, is analyze the, the, the leading dependence, the, 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 the leading scaling with, with log KIR, uh, which is to say, uh, just, to, just to, to be strictly technical about what we've done, uh, had we not reorganized the theory by the Fokker Planck equation, um, perturbation theory would have broken down by times that scaled like the inverse square root of the coupling in a phi to the fourth theory. But because we've done the leading log e summation, we still have control of the theory at this level. Now, one could of course worry that, uh, that, that the subleading logs actually uh, spoil everything. Um, but the fact that the, that the Fokker Planck solution, if we just take it seriously for the moment and assume that contributions which are subleading perturbatively remain subleading non-perturbatively. Uh, the fact that the, that the leading solution is exactly where you would have expected on physical grounds, uh, that gives you some hope that that works out, but that of course is still, still an open question. So <clears throat> as I said, this, this puzzle is, is non-trivial and interesting in its own right, and of course we would like to understand things like uh, next to leading log, 
uh, other corrections, what happens when one includes uh, quantum corrections to the, to the semi-classical evolution we've put in. Um, I think a very nice feature of Leonardo and Victor's paper is that they've already, they've already begun the work of, of, of including some of these subleading corrections for getting things beyond just, uh, just the, single, the single point probability distribution. Um, but of course, we are also interested in things beyond just light scalars in a fixed consider background. We'd like to relax, uh, relax fact reaction to attack uh, questions in eternal inflation. Um, there are other infrared, similar infrared problems that occur when one does perturbative gravity in the sitter. Um, it would be interesting to, to understand what happens uh, when one includes dynamical gravity, what happens when, when one's propagating gravitons as well. Um, as Leonardo said, that, that looks like it, it should be, that there should be a sense in which that's controlled perturbatively, um, but there are infrared questions involving gravitons. And of course, there may be some implications for the holography of the sitter. If we can get the wave functional or the wave functional mod squared at the boundary of the theory, um, perhaps that gives us some interesting holographic data. So um, thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks for the talk. And uh, uh, questions? Don't be shy, question, please. Uh, I don't see any, so uh, maybe uh, maybe a I can make a maybe I can make a comment. Uh, Matthew, yes. I really like the, this this uh, this uh, uh, this proof that the the logarithms are only there. I mean, the way the maximum level of divergence uh, using this retard degrees function. Personally, I like it very much. But uh, um, concerning the the the, the subleading corrections, I think uh, in, in our paper we actually uh, are able to show that. Uh, First, we compute them, uh, the square root of lambdas, mm -hmm. and then we're able to show that perturbation theory uh, will never destabilize uh, because uh, one does perturbation theory using the stochastic. Uh, you said this in what is you were implying this that using the mm -hmm. stochastic equation, the leading orders, the stochastic equation. Of course, at the next order, the stochastic equation is modified. I mean, there are more terms, it's different, right? But, right. Uh, but the structure, uh, the, the, the propagate, there is never a, a, a in the stochastic approach, uh, never, uh, never appears, one can prove that there never appears in a hard direction again. Right. Mm. Okay, you're saying, so, so just, just so I understand, uh, you're saying that when you, you can show that all of the subleading, all of the dependence which is subleading on the infrared divergence, it, it can always, it, it, it always remains finite, that, that you've essentially proven this to all logarithmic order? Or, mm. or, or, or yeah. you have... I mean, if, well, no, it's a kind of semi... I mean, once... Because the setup is not going to the diagrams anymore, but going to the Fokker Planck equation. And, uh, well, uh, in, in fact, we also explicitly compute the, the subleading ones, right? It's not that mm -hmm. they're not in, right, right, right. just every space. Yeah, and then one sees the perturbation theory. Because, right, so, one, so, uses yeah. the, this, because one uses the, 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 I mean, since you know, one uses the eigenvalues of, of the, an eigenfashion of the Fokker plug. Perturbation theory is organized around the eigenfashion of this Fokker plug. Right, right, right. So everything is damped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I guess I guess the question is if if you go back to the field theory, how do you know that you know it, uh -huh. how do you know it say the fourth you know end of the fourth LL something doesn't come along and blow everything up and now you just can't use Fokker Planck. Um, no, because uh, our approach was to derive Fokker Planck from the density. We never right. talk about diagrams. Right. We, we derive the, the, the Fokker Planck. I mean, an equation which is not, you can, one can call it Fokker Planck, but it, uh, it's actually an equation that is constructed order by order in square root of lambda. And right. uh, it's not really Fokker Planck. It's only Fokker Planck and leading order. Yeah. So, 
but but as long as quantum mechanics, I mean, we use uh, the the Schrodinger equation, in a sense, and that's okay. Right. No, this is an interesting part. I'd like to understand it. So maybe we can maybe we can continue this discussion yeah, yeah, sure. offline. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Again, I, given given how nice the leading log solution is, and that it, and it leads to such an intuitive <coughs> resolution, um, it, it it seems you know. It seems quite reasonable that, that the contributions that are subleading perturbatively remain subleading non perturbatively. But um, I'd like to understand your resolution of that. And like I said, I, I, I saw that it, it was apparent to me that you had sort of worked out the next set of corrections. But I, I guess I want to understand to what extent uh, this is an all orders demonstration that you've gotten. But maybe we should, we should continue that uh, over, over email or Skype. Absolutely. Okay, uh, there is a raised hand by Yuko Urakawa in the audience. Oh, hi, so, uh, hi, please uh, ask your question. Uh, yes, yeah, so I have a general question about, uh, so the dispersion is determined roughly when the potential becomes, uh, of, you know, eight square becomes of order potential. And how general is it? Like, so the expression of phi square, is a square divided by square root lambda can right. be derived by equating the squares in the potential. And um, given that if there is like a violation of G2 symmetry in potential, or how, well, just uh, you're, you're asking if I, if I, if my, if my potential breaks the Sitter symmetry, what, how that changes? <laughs> okay. Just the question is how general, you know, for other potentials, is there some simple way I, to I get? Think, I, I believe this for any sort of monomial potential. Um, I think an interesting, I think an interesting follow-up exercise would be to study this and say, a, uh, a, you know, a Mexican hat type potential or just a two minimum potential. Uh, and then you could, you could go from there. Um, because I, I guess na naively you might guess that if it, if it really is just e to the minus v in general for an arb sort of an arbitrary shaped v, but let's say it's, it's uh, you know, perturbative and, you know, ha has good, good stable minima, um, I think that would be an interesting follow-up uh, to understand what happens in the case of multiple, multiple minima. But as long as, you know, if there's just a single minimum and I have, let's say, at least the initial phase of my theory uh, before too much time evolution is perturbative, uh, then, then this holds. So again, we, we took this to be essentially any, any even polynomial potential other than five squared. That's where I know this result holds. Even if there is like a summation of the powers with odd numbers? Um, Again, as long as there's only a single minimum, okay, then everything's fine. But yes, one, once I start putting in other powers, if if, if I have multiple minima, um, I don't claim to have, I don't claim to have that case analyzed. But I think it would be very okay. interesting, and I I would guess that I would guess that it's the same solution. But I don't. But that's just a conjecture. Um, okay. Just because, just because you sort of have this, if, if you go back to the nice physical picture Leonardo showed, um, you sort of have, right, quantum fluctuations are trying to random walk everything, uh, everything away, and the classical evolution is trying to drive things down to the minimum, and they wind up kind of fighting each other to draw. Um, you could also, I don't know, maybe, maybe if it's multi-minimum, uh, but your potential barrier is sort of higher than you could crawl up with sort of a Hubble energy budget to fluctuate. Maybe in fact you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to explore uh, you wouldn't be able to explore other minima. Um, that's probably that's probably the guess I'm gonna I'm gonna land on and you know off the top of my head. Um, but if but if your potential is multi minimum but shallow and you could actually fluctuate over all of the barrier heights with just Hubble scale fluctuations, uh, then I suspect you wind up with a with, with e to the minus v again as you were. Solution. So, so maybe may, maybe the not maybe the interesting case to study then is is multi minimum with high barriers, um, and then I might expect that it actually your initial what which minimum you started in actually winds up being crucially important um, for what you get through in the end.
Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. but uh, again, again, likewise, I'd, 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 love to, I'd love to chat more offline. Perfect. Uh, so uh, I don't see any questions more. So um, thank you both for the for the very nice talk, and thank you also for uh, uh, all the audience. And uh, see you next time.